Well, as we get started this morning, uh, if you're visiting with us, my name's Casey Cockerham. I'm the pastor of Discipleship and Connections. Darren Canary, our senior pastor, is not here today. He and Jen are ill, uh, so please be praying for them. We are in the midst of a series called Disillusioned, as you just saw by the intro, which is all about doubt. And I want to speak to our teenagers for just a second. So I want to speak to you. Hi. I want to speak to you for a couple of reasons. One, because I love teenagers. I used to be a youth pastor. I don't know if you know that. So I'm excited to have you guys here. I wish you guys were here like this every Sunday. I want to challenge you to do that. Come just take over these rows. I love that there's probably a few adults that came in this morning and they're disgruntled because their seat is taken. That just brings joy to my heart because no one here has their own seat, in case I've ever had a chance to say that to you. You don't have a seat here. Your name isn't on the pew, and if it was, we'd scratch it off. So I'm glad you're here this morning. I want to say to you this morning a couple of things. One, I know you're really sleepy, and so I want to encourage you to try your best to to stay awake. It may help if you take out a pen and a piece of paper and not just draw pictures, but take notes about what I'm going to say this morning. And part of the reason I say that to you is this. What I'm going to be talking about this morning is something that will really help you, not only at this stage of your life, but in the next five or six years. Because in your stage of life, you're figuring out what you're going to do with your life. You're figuring out what life is all about. You're figuring out who you are and who you're going to be. And I promise you, there will come some times in this time frame of your life where you will have some questions about God, you will have some questions about Bible, the Bible, and you will face some doubts. And you may, if you go to college, you may hear some professors talk about how they think Christians are just crazy. How could they possibly think there was a literal 24-hour seven-day-a-week creation, and how could they possibly believe the Bible is true, and things like that. And so what I'm going to be talking about this morning can feel a little bit like a lecture, or like you're in school. It's not going to be funny, like I like to be sometimes. There's not going to be a lot of fun stories, but if you'll take notes, and if you'll hold on to those, they will help you in times in the future when you run into certain people that ask you questions you don't know the answer to. And questions are like, man, I don't know, I never thought about that. And I just want you to know that while those questions may be new to you, they're not new. These questions have been around for a couple thousands of years, and just as there are pretty brilliant people who think Christianity is crazy, there are just as many, if not more, brilliant people who can defend God's Word. And I want to let you know that those resources exist, and I'm going to talk about some of those this morning. So I didn't mean to ignore you in that. That's just as important for you guys, but as you know, because we're all older, you've been there and you've done that and you've probably faced those doubts. You've probably faced those questions. You've heard some of the things people have to say. And so what we're talking about in this Disillusion series is really important. So for the past couple of weeks, Pastor Darren's been talking about the idea of doubt. And I hope this sermon series has been encouraging for you so far, because if you haven't been here, one of the things Pastor Darren has said is, it's okay to doubt. You need to hear that. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to ask questions. But when you face doubts, instead of running from God, I want to encourage you to run to God. When you face doubts, instead of running from Scripture, run to God. Scripture, because in Scripture, in God, you will find innumerable reasons to have assurance of faith. There are a lot of things that can lead us to doubt. There are just difficult things in life that can lead us to doubt. The, maybe your first boyfriend or girlfriend, you break up and you feel like there is no point in living anymore. That's very real when you have your first boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Can I get an amen from the adults? Amen. There's lots of great music written about that, right? That's something that a lot of us have gone through. There are things like the tragic death of a loved one. There are things like natural disasters or wars that take the lives of thousands of good people. There are things like Pastor Darren talked about last week, like our own misguided expectations of God or simply the difference between God's perspective and our perspective that sometimes leads us to be confused or fearful. There are even things within the pages of Scripture, such as biblical stories that 
seem to us at times maybe to be unbelievable or cultural or moral issues in the Bible that we read about with our modern eyes and ears and they just don't seem right to us because we have a different perspective than God. In a recent online article, someone wrote in with the following question, and it's, it's, a, it's actually a few sentences of not question, but it will get to a question, all right? But some of you may be able to relate to some of this person's question. This is what they wrote in. God in the Old Testament commanded his people to commit genocide, wiped out the entire world population in one fell swoop, sent plagues and devastation, and created a world full of people, but decided to only reveal himself and his rules to one group of people and condemn the rest to hell because they didn't worship him. And then we're told in the New Testament that God is a God of love and mercy. And his followers are to spread peace, not hate, and that we're to follow the example of Jesus who did nothing to stop his enemies from killing him. I'm all for believing the New Testament record of Jesus and his followers, but how can anybody possibly believe that God, as the Bible says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Teenagers, if you've never heard people ask questions like that, you will. Maybe you've asked those questions. Adults, I have to believe you've asked these questions. These are very normal things to think about. Why does God seem so different in the Old Testament and New Testament is kind of the question that comes out from these things. God seems so different in the Old Testament than the New Testament. Why does it seem like in the Old Testament God's always full of wrath and judgment, but then in the New Testament he's all about love and peace and grace? And so that is kind of the issue that we're going to be looking at this morning. I forgot to bring something up with me, and I want to grab it real quick because it's a book that I want to highly encourage you to check out. If these are questions that you ever wrestle with, there's a book, and I'm going to refer to it a little bit later. There's a book called, Is God a Moral Monster? Is God a Moral Monster? It's written by a gentleman named Paul Copen, and the subtitle is Making Sense of the Old Testament. It is a great book. I could preach through every chapter of the book, because he's 20 times smarter than me, and reading through it is so helpful. So I want to encourage that to you this morning. But this morning, as we're looking at this question of why does God seem different in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I want to walk you through two paths. That's kind of the outline for the sermon this morning. We're going to go down two different paths that I think will help you to have a broader understanding of God and a broader understanding of Scripture. And here's what we're going to do. First, I want to look at three incredibly important concepts that have to do with interpreting and understanding Scripture. So that's the first place we're going to be. Then we're going to look at God's character, and we're going to compare what we see in the Old Testament and what we see in the New Testament so that we can discern whether his character is consistent throughout Scripture. All right? You with me? All right. So let's go. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to look at three incredibly important concepts that we need to consider when we're reading and interpreting Scripture. And the first is context. You guys may have learned about this in English class or literature. Context. When we read the Bible, we bring a lot of ourselves to the table. Our life experiences shape the way we think. And so when we read certain words, we think we know the meaning. But because the Bible was written in a different time, a couple thousand years ago, with, in the midst of different cultural norms than what we live in, it's important that we understand the context in which Scripture was written. So as we read the Bible and we're trying to understand it, we need to think about, first of all, what was God trying to say to the original audience that he was writing to? What did this passage of Scripture mean to the original audience? And then we need to consider how it relates to us today. So here are some questions that you can think through when you're reading Scripture. And by the way, as I go through these questions, you're going to be thinking like, I don't know how to find the answers to those things. I want you to know in advance, if you have a study Bible, the intro to books of Scripture, it will have all of this information. If you get on Amazon and buy a commentary of Scripture, if you know of good Christian websites that you can trust, that's an important qualification there. You can go on there and they will tell you this type of information. But here are some questions you need to think through about the context. Number one, what type of literature am I reading? 
So the Bible has different types of writings in it. Some of the books of the Bible are historical. There are some that are about the law. There are some books of Scripture that are prophecy. There are some books of Scripture that are poetic. And there are some books of Scripture that are apocalyptic literature. These are very different types of writings. And if you don't understand the type of writing that you're reading, it can be as confusing as reading a biography and expecting it to read like a murder mystery. Right? If you're expecting one thing, but that's not what it is, it's another thing, you're going to be very confused when you're reading it. Another question is, what time period or law governed God's people when this book of the Bible was written? So based on the law that was going on in that time, based on the time period, you need to know that context. Number three, during what situation or culture or time was this book written? For instance, what country or king was ruling at that time? What were the cultural norms of their society in which they lived at that time? Number four, who is the audience of this book? And for what purpose was the author writing to them? That matters. Number five, and this is the last one, how does this story, or sorry, how does the story or purpose of this particular book of the Bible fit into the bigger picture of the Bible? So as we're going to see in some examples of Scripture this morning, we might read something that to us, as we're just reading it out of context, makes God or his laws seem barbaric or strange to our modern ears. But when we understand the context to which God was speaking, we realize that his laws were much more gracious, much more life-giving than what the people of that day were used to. So to us, it may sound very weird and, like I said, barbaric, but to them, it was like, oh, that's very different. That's very gracious. That's, very, that's much kinder than what our culture does. The second concept you need to understand, so the first is context. The second is, I'm going to use a, a seminary word for you just so you can show off to your friends if you want, the meta-narrative. All that means is the bigger picture. It's crucial that we understand how a specific passage of Scripture fits into the bigger picture of the Bible. For example, to the great disappointment of those of you who are Star Wars fans, I don't understand those movies. I know, you can boo at me, you can hiss, I get it. I watch those movies. I enjoy some of the things about those movies. Like, I like, you know, the, the different characters, and I like some of the battle sequences, and I like the special effects. But typically, if I'm watching a Star Wars movie, I have no idea what's going on. Anybody else with me? By chance? Okay, more than I expected, good. Uh, to those of you who are huge Star Wars fans, I apologize, whatever. But here's the deal. The reason I don't enjoy those movies a lot and the reason I'm confused is because I don't understand the overarching story. So when I'm watching a specific movie, I don't know what part it plays in the bigger picture. Those of you who are big fans, you understand the bigger story. And you understand what role this specific movie plays in the bigger picture. And so as you're watching the movie, you're seeing the subplot unfold. You're seeing certain characters being introduced into the film that you know will play a big part three movies later. And the same goes for other movies such as the Harry Potter series, which by the way I'm just now reading like 10 years after the fact. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe, all these types of things. And in the exact same way, by the way, my son Thomas helped me with this portion of the sermon. I was like, does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. And my sons can't comprehend how I don't know the difference between Marvel characters and what's the other universe? DC, thanks. I'm that guy. I don't know. I mean, Thomas would be like four years old, like, Dad, what's your favorite Marvel superhero? And I'd answer with a DC super. He's like, that's not Marvel. That's DC. How don't you know this? I'm like, I don't know, dude. I don't. I don't keep up. But the same way with all these things, it's the same with the Bible. So when you read a book of the Bible and you don't understand the bigger picture, of course that's not going to make sense to you. You don't understand the bigger picture. You don't understand what's going on. And so when that happens, this is what happens. If you've ever read the Bible and you read something that just doesn't make sense to you or you don't understand why it's even in the Bible or it makes God seem not good, 
It's because you don't understand the bigger picture. It's very important for you to understand. By the way, little advertisement, this is why we offer the class called 30 Days to Understanding the Bible, taught by Paul and Shadow Roberts. Yay. It helps you understand. I was hoping for some applause or something, but, you know, that's, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this class really is phenomenal because it helps you to understand the story of the whole Bible as well as the purpose of each of the individual parts. So, by the way, we're going to kick that class off. We're going to re-kick it off in a few weeks. So, if you'd like to sign up, go for it. Okay, the third concept we're going to look at is called progressive revelation. It's on the screen if you don't know how to spell that. Progressive revelation. This one takes a little more explaining. So this is a doctrine of Christianity. And progressive revelation explains the idea that God revealed himself to his people over the course of many centuries, periodically giving new information that built on but did not contradict or deny what came before. So the progression we find in Scripture is not from untruth to truth, it's from less information to more information, as God revealed himself more and more to his people. So, for example, in the Old Testament, we find that God reveals himself to Abraham, and he gives the promise of salvation. Then he reveals himself to Moses, and he gives the law. After that, he reveals himself to the prophets, and they give more re revelation regarding God and his plans for the future. And then God reveals himself through Jesus and the apostolic writings of the New Testament that explain the work of Jesus and his future plans. And so the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. He, under, he kind of explains this idea of progressive revelation without using those words. He says, Now to the one who is able to strengthen you, According to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. So Paul was explaining that while God in former days hinted at what was to come, he was now fully revealing his plan through Jesus. When we don't understand progressive revelation, we read some of the laws in the Old Testament that were specific to a different century, a different time, a different culture, and we get confused about why those laws existed. For example, the law given to Moses was given for a specific period of time. And then it was set aside, not because it was bad and now it's abolished, but because it was good and its purpose was fulfilled through Jesus. Scripture explains this in Romans 3, verses 19 through 24. Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Listen to what he says. But now... A righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets of the Old Testament testified. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So Paul's trying to explain that the law was given to make us conscious of our sin and point us to Jesus. Because when people tried to live by the law, it was impossible. No one was able to be perfect. And they kept, re they kept having to sacrifice animals and do that for centuries. And that was all pointing to the need for a perfect sacrifice who was to come in Jesus. So sometimes when we read the Old Testament, it can seem legalistic and weird and out of touch with our present reality. And it can lead us to feel sometimes like God is just this big rule giver in the sky rather than a loving father who is teaching his children as much as he can about himself as we can understand it. Now, I want to address something real quick before we move in. As you hear this idea of progressive revelation, some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, this sounds kind of relativistic. You're saying that certain laws were right in the Old Testament, but now there's another standard for what's right for us? 
I want to assure you that is not what I'm saying. Here's kind of the pattern we find in Scripture. In Genesis, at the very beginning, when God created everything, He created our world the way it was supposed to be. So in creation, we see His ultimate ideals regarding human equality and dignity. But then mankind sinned. And as we fell into sin, there was more and more sin. And our cultures became more and more sinful. And so in the Old Testament world, we see a huge deviation from God's ideals in the form of fallen social structures and human hard-heartedness. And God had to work in the midst of that. Then as we move throughout the Old Testament, incremental steps are given to Israel that tolerate certain moral deficiencies, but are constantly encouraging God's people to strive to a higher moral plane. So we see some of our heroes of the faith with multiple wives in the Old Testament and people that don't know the Bible and don't study it, they just want to pick out things that are wrong, say, see, God allowed polygamy. God didn't want polygamy, but he used men in spite of that because their culture had become so sinful and he was constantly calling them out of things like that back toward what he originally established. To illustrate this concept, Paul Copen, in this book that I mentioned, Is God a Moral Monster? He explains that as we progress throughout Scripture, we see with increasing clarity how women and slaves in Scripture are affirmed as human beings with dignity and worth. And so he gives us a picture of how this works. This, these are things that a lot of times atheists or other people point out about the Bible, that there's sexism and that there's slaves and stuff like this. This is how Paul Copen explains it. In the original ancient Near East culture, by the way, the ancient Near East is the culture in which the Old Testament was written. In that culture, when it comes to slaves, the general treatment of slaves, by the way, slaves were different in this day. It wasn't a racial thing. It was people who were in debt who went into slavery because they couldn't pay their bills. But nonetheless, it wasn't right. But in the ancient Near East culture, the general treatment of slaves was very brutal and demeaning. And slaves were typically at the mercy of their masters, and if there was a runaway slave, they had to be returned to their master and they would be killed. So in the midst of that culture, then we have the Old Testament given. And in the Old Testament, though there are still various slave laws that are problematic to our modern ears, the Old Testament presents a redemptive move toward God's ultimate ethic. So the Old Testament presents a redemptive move towards God's ultimate ethic there were limited punishments in contrast to their culture. There was a more humanized attitude towards slaves. And runaway foreign slaves were given refuge in Israel. Still not ideal, but it was better than their culture. In the New Testament, there's another step forward. Slaves in the Roman Empire were incorporated into the body of Christ without distinction for masters. They were considered the same as everybody in the church. Masters in the New Testament were to show concern for their slaves. Slaves were encouraged to gain their freedom. Still not ideal, but moving it forward. And then there's the ultimate ideal. Like I said, this is what creation speaks of in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where we are told that we, everyone, every human that's ever been created, we are God's image bearers. And we are to live and work together harmoniously and fairly. And everyone is to be graciously treated. And everyone is to be viewed as full persons and equal. And genuine humanness is restored in Christ. However, and this is important to understand, as we look at this pattern of redemptive movement throughout Scripture, and you ask this question of, wait a minute, this seems like it could be relativism. I want you to understand that while we see a redemptive movement for some issues, we do not see that in all issues. For example, hot button issue in our day, homosexuality. This issue in Scripture is consistently viewed negatively as a departure from God's creational design. So while we see a movement forward with some of these other moral issues, in Scripture, rather than revealing a progression in attitudes regarding homosexual activity, Scripture from beginning to end is uniformly negative in its evaluation. So homosexual behavior, although it was very common in the ancient Near East in which the Old Testament was written, and it was very common in the Greco-Roman world in which the New Testament was written, 
was simply foreign to Jewish and Christian ethnic ethics. So we don't find relativism in the Bible, but we do see a gradually improving moral fabric of God's people in the midst of the sinfulness of the cultures in which they live. I know that's a lot. I know that's like sitting in class. I know there's a lot of tough stuff to, to explain. You can ask Hunter about it later. He's got all the answers. But as we think through these three things, context and the bigger picture, the meta narrative and progressive revelation, now we get to, and I promise I only have about 10 more minutes. You're like, man, you're only done with half of it? We can't go that much longer. There's only about 10 more minutes, okay? So don't be nervous. Now we get to our question, is God's character consistent? And so here's how we're going to answer that. We're going to look at see if God's character in the Old Testament is only full of wrath and judgment, or is there also grace and love and compassion? And then we're going to look at the New Testament. We're going to see, is it only grace and compassion? Or do we also see God's wrath and judgment in the New Testament? So let's get going. I'm going to pick up my rate of speech here because while I say I only have 10 minutes, there's like 18 minutes worth of content. And I'm going to try to squeeze it in. You ready? So, so, so I see some people like, not really, dude. You're killing us. So we don't have to get very far in the Old Testament to see the first example of God's love and grace. In the book of Genesis, amidst the story of creation, God created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. He walked with them, he talked with them, he created them in such a way that they did not know or experience anything negative. Can you imagine? Life and the earth were perfect. Lions and lambs could hang out together and play and frolic, and the lion didn't eat the lamb. There was no sin. There was no death. And there was only one rule. In Genesis 2, 15 through 17, we read, The Lord God took man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam and Eve had no reason to disobey God. They had no reason to disrespect his desires. They had everything they could have possibly wanted, but in spite of God's goodness to them, they disobeyed. And because of what we just read in verse 17, we would expect them, as we're reading, to just drop dead. But they don't. But what we do find is they face very serious consequences. For the first time ever, they now experience shame and guilt and blame, and fear, and separation from God. So while they didn't die physically, they did die spiritually because God's presence was removed from them and he banished them from the garden. But in the midst of all these consequences, we also see God's love and compassion. We see in Genesis 3.21 that God clothed Adam and Eve. They felt naked and unashamed. They were naked before, but they weren't ashamed. Now that there was sin, they felt ashamed. And so in the midst of their sin, God clothed them so they wouldn't feel naked and ashamed anymore. God took care of them, even in the midst of their sin. And I want you to think about this. Where did those garments come from? God had to kill a couple of animals so that he could clothe them to take care of their nakedness. There had never been death before, but God sacrificed a couple of animals on their behalf to take care of them, even though they had sinned. So their sin not only resulted in their spiritual death, it also resulted in death, in this case for animals, but not their own. God sacrificed for them, and he showed them love and compassion in the midst of their disobedience. Not, further, not much further into the Old Testament, we find that God began a covenant relationship with Abraham. That in and of itself is love and compassion because Abraham didn't deserve a relationship with God. But Abraham had this covenant from God that God would make him into a great nation and he would bless him. He would make his name great. And through Abraham and his offspring, he would bless the entire earth. But as we read on, we find in Genesis 15 that God tells Abraham what the future is going to look like for his people. And we see in verses 13 through 16, he tells Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country that's not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, listen to this part, 
For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. God was explaining to Abraham that after 400 years, he would deliver the nation of Israel, his children, from slavery, but not until the full measure of sin had come about for the Amorites. In other words, he waited 400 years, giving them the chance to repent. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. He wanted them to repent, and he said, I'm going to wait 400 years, but after that amount of time, in his righteousness, he had to judge them. We see the same desire to save rather than to judge throughout the prophets of the Old Testament. Do you remember when God told Jonah to go to the Ninevites and preach to them that they might repent? And in this, we see that God's compassion is greater than Jonah's because Jonah's like, I don't want to go preach to those jerks. And God's like, why not? And he's like, because they might repent and you might forgive them and I don't want you to. I hate them. And God says, go to them. We know the whole story But here's the deal. When Jonah finally did go and preach to them, we see in Jonah 3, 5, it says this, the Ninevites believed God. This is a whole nation of wicked people, but when Jonah preached to them, they believed and they declared a fast. And it says all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth and they repented. And then in chapter 4, verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. And he did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. How about the New Testament? We see God's love and compassion in the Old Testament, as well as his wrath and judgment. But how about the New Testament? Isn't it all just love and compassion and peace? Do we ever see wrath and judgment? We often like to see Jesus as a sweet little baby in a manger, or as a humble and meek and kind man. But I want you to see that Jesus didn't mince words when it came to sin. Do you remember how he responded in the temple courts when he found people doing business and exchanging money rather than committing themselves to prayer and the worship of God? We see in John chapter 2, starting in verse 13, it says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, get out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market? I want you to understand, this is not Jesus having a temper and losing control. He didn't just not have his coffee that day. It says that he made a whip. Do you know how long it takes to weave leather into a whip? He didn't just lose control. This was planned. He took the time to make a whip and think about what he was doing. And then Jesus, because he's not playing games, he goes into the temple and he's cracking that whip and turning over tables and he says, get out. This is not what my father's house is supposed to be about. While this wasn't inappropriate for Jesus to do, it definitely doesn't come across as gentle and meek and compassionate, does it? Can you imagine if Pastor Darren came in here with a whip yelling at people? A lot of you would not be back the next Sunday, right? We see another example of God's wrath and judgment in the New Testament in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to tell the people running slides, I'm going to skip the scripture here. I'm just going to tell you what happens. It's in Acts Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. You can look at it while I'm talking so you know I'm not lying, all right? But I'm trying to fast forward because I've gone too long. In this chapter, there's a guy named Ananias and a lady named Sapphira. They're married. They sell some of their land, and they're going to bring it as an offering to the church. They could have brought however much they wanted as the offering. That money was theirs because they sold their land. But when they sold their land, they told God and they told the church they were giving it all. But they didn't give it all. They only brought a portion of it. And so when they brought it, they were asked, hey, is this everything? And Ananias, the husband's in first, and he says, yep, that's everything. And we see that Peter says to him, how dare you lie to the Holy Spirit? And at that moment, he dropped dead. And guys came and they dragged his body out. A few minutes later, after they dragged his body out, his wife came in. Guess what happened? She comes in with a portion of the money, and Peter says, hey, is this all the money that you promised God? You promised you were going to give? And she said, yep, this is all of it. 
And he says, Sapphira, how dare you? Your husband's body was just dragged out of here because you guys lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to the church. And then she drops dead. And she's dragged out. They could have done whatever they wanted with the money. It's not about the money. It's about the fact that they lied to God. Similarly, in Acts 13, we read this other story. This is kind of crazy. Paul and Barnabas travel to Seleucia, and they're spreading the gospel, and they share Jesus with this government official named Sergius Paulus. But then we are told that there's a sorcerer named Elymas, and he opposed them, and he tries to turn Sergius Paulus away from the faith. We see in Acts 13, verses 9 through 12, it says, Then Paul, who was also called, sorry, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked straight at Elymas, and he said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, and you will be unable to see the light of the sun. And immediately mist and a darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And it says, when that proconsul that they were witnessing to saw what had happened, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. God is a God that is slow to anger and abounding in love, but He's also the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Holy One. And in His righteousness, He must judge sin. And here's what I want you to catch as we conclude. In the biggest storyline of the Bible, we find all these attributes of God come crashing together. His love, His grace, His compassion, His wrath, and his judgment, all of them are very apparent in the story of Jesus' death and crucifixion and resurrection. Because through Jesus' death, God in his holiness was judging sin. Not Jesus' sin, he was placing on Jesus our sin, the sin of the world. And because he's righteous, he has to judge sin. But in Jesus' perfection and holiness, he was the perfect sacrifice that would take our sin once and for all. And so through his sacrifice, God was once again showing his love and compassion and grace. And here's what I want you to see, teenagers and everybody. Even though the Bible is 66 individual books written on multiple continents in three different languages over the, over the period of approximately 15 years, more than 40 authors, it remains one unified book from beginning to end without contradiction. And in it, We see a loving, merciful, and just God, and we see how He deals with humans in all kinds of situations. And throughout the Bible, we see how God lovingly and mercifully is calling us into a special relationship with Himself, not because we deserve it, but because He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Yet we also see A holy and righteous God who is the judge of all those who disobey His Word and refuse to worship Him. And because of God's righteous and holy character, all sin, past, present, and future must be judged. But in His infinite love, He has provided a payment for sin and a way of reconciliation so that we can escape His wrath. This is what 1 John 4.10 says. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. I want you to understand today that God loves you. That's why we have the Bible. God has given us the overarching story. He has explained that we can't be perfect. That's why we were given the law People tried to be perfect and they couldn't do it. And we still can't do it today. And he gave the Old Testament sacrificial system. And it didn't work because they were going to run out of animals. Because we can't be perfect. And then he sent Jesus as the perfect sacrifice. His own son. And in his righteousness and judgment, he allowed his son to die in our place, that we might be saved from sin, that we might be saved from death, that he would exchange our sin for his righteousness. He's so loving that he allowed his only son to die in our place. And if you don't know that, I want you to know that Jesus died for you. 
And by placing your faith in Him, by surrendering your life to Him, by giving Him control, by choosing to follow Jesus, you can be forgiven of your sin and you can have a relationship with God and you can have an eternity with Him that can start today. And I just want to pose this question to you, why not today? What would you possibly wait for? Let's pray. God.